relations with people, Jesus' words and actions. For Christians, we really should pay more attention to Jesus. There are those who love the Old Testament stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs of our faith, the stories of Deborah and Queen Esther and other women of the Old Testament. I love those too. And there are those who love the Psalms, like Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? Psalm 121, I look to the hills from which comes my help. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. I love that psalm. It brings in God's credentials and gives you faith that God can handle your stuff too. Psalm 100, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the, the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into the Lord's presence with singing. Thank you, Ingrid. These are all important to the faith, as is the prophets. Jeremiah has given us wonderful words like Jeremiah 29, 11. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not to harm you, to give you hope and a future like Isaiah in Isaiah 40 and 31, but those who hope in the Lord shall renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not get weary. They will walk and not be faint. Or like Amos, the prophet Amos, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness, like an ever-flowing stream. I love, what a gift. The Old Testament is for us. It gives us the history and the songs of our faith, and it lets us hear God speak through the prophets that still inspire us today and sometimes correct us today. Going over to the New Testament, I appreciate the Apostle Paul, who is credited with writing about a third of the New Testament, says letters to the churches and the Christians at Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and more. The Apostle Paul, who can be controversial for sure, if you don't know how, talk to me after service. But indeed, he gave us wonderful sacred scriptures like Romans 8. I happen to know that Curtis likes this text. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation, Thank you, Paul. We'll be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. As Christians, we should certainly have an appreciation and a gratitude for Paul and all his contributions to the sacred text. And it should all point us to the Gospels. And what has been recorded as the moves and the actions and the words of Jesus, it is indeed that lo love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord that should get our attention more and more as Christians. What does that love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord sound like? And what does it look like and feel like when we hear from Jesus? I'm glad you asked. Let's go to today's text. Jesus is love. Say that with me. Jesus is love. Y'all got another chance. Thank God for do-overs. Jesus is love. Amen. And what does, what he does and says, he does and says out of love. In today's text, Matthew 13, 1. 
reads, that same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat, picture it, sat there while the whole crowd stood at the beach. Somebody knows what I love about this text. Jesus is on the beach. Amen, somebody. Jesus went outside, the scripture said, and he went and sat by the sea. And then people began to gather. So there goes his quiet time, right? People began to gather. And so he saw it as an opportunity to preach and teach on the beach. So the first lesson today is to get outside. And some of you may say, well, of course we're going outside. It's warm. But you would not believe the people who may even be right around us who do not enjoy the outdoors. And not that they don't enjoy it, but there's something that stops them from getting outside. And you all know I work for an environmental justice organization now and, and certainly have a greater, I already had an appreciation for creation and the beautiful water and the land and the sand and the birds and the butterflies and all of it. This wonderful landscape that God gave us for living and some of us walk right past it and don't pay it any mind. We're missing out. This is natural, God-made beauty and sounds. It's flowers and trees, birds. It teaches us so much. If you think about the scriptures, think about how often nature is referred to. Jesus said, look at the birds of the air. They neither so, right, they don't, but, but they don't worry about what they're going to eat, but we worry about everything. There are scriptures, there's so much in the text. Why? Because that original audience, they were very familiar. They spent more time outdoors than we did. That's why they could eat bread and wine and not get diabetes, right? They, because they were always walking and always, they didn't have all these luxuries that we have. And we get so stuck and so insular. And so my first point today is simply to find more time to get outdoors, not to go somewhere. Some of us have wonderful porches and backyards that get no use. Some of us are steps from the lake and we never go. And I know Chicago gets hectic in the warm weather because when it gets cold, we're all locked up. But I'm encouraging you to enjoy the nature that God gave us freely. Spend some time. And if you get stuck and, and you can't seem to do it, meditate on verse 1 of today, Matthew 13. Just, just meditate it. Just say it throughout the week. Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. Say it again. Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. Do this. If you need help doing it, you've got a church family reach out to someone and say, you know, I really want to go outside, but I'm concerned or I'm afraid or I don't want to do it alone. And I promise you, because I know High Park Union Church, we will come and help you go outside. Amen? Out of the love that Jesus has for people, he was outside and the people gathered. He said, oh, okay, you all are here. It's time to teach. Look at what he did. He got on a boat and he moved onto the water and sat there. It's like he created a pulpit out of the boat. It says in the text, the crowd is on the beach. I love it. I love it. I love it. I've been asking worship committee, get us to promontory point. Get us on the beach. Okay, I'll let it go. But we're going to get to the beach and we're going to worship on the beach. He says to the crowd in verse th uh, three, it says, he told them many things 
in parables, saying, listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns. The thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Jesus says, let anyone with ears listen. Jesus tells the people a parable, teaching a spiritual lesson through allegory, and he teaches a lesson that is foundational to our faith. The parable uses a context that many, if not most of the people of that day, understood. It's an agrarian culture, so the people are familiar with farming, certainly more familiar than most of us are. And that's to say that Jesus is speaking their language. Some of them will get it, and those who don't fully get it can learn it from others in the crowd. If they're standing next to a farmer, you can say, this is, this is what he means by that, because they understand farming. And so Jesus is speaking their language, and he basically gives a lesson on soil quality and what happens with seeds that are sown by a farmer depending on the soil quality. If seeds are sown and they fall on the path, birds get the seeds. They never take root, unless, at least not for that farmer. If seeds are sown and they fall on rocky ground where there's not much soil, they spring up quickly, but there's no real root because that root can't grow downward into the earth. And then the, the sun will come and scorch it and they'll wither away. Other seeds fall among thorns or weeds you can think of, and those plants will be choked. But verse 8 says, other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain. Some 160, some 30-fold. Jesus, the brilliant storyteller, immediately has them and us hopefully doing a soil check. How is my soil? Hopefully you're asking, he's given these differences, which one am I? Jesus, within the story, gives us ways to test our soil, and that is by the outcome of the seeds that have been sown in our faith. Let's take a step back a bit. Jesus, out of love, is trying to change people's hearts and minds. He's teaching lessons like love your neighbor as yourself. He's teaching lessons like even though the law might say stone the woman who is caught in adultery, he teaches grace and says, let he who is without sin cast the first stone and tells the woman, where are your accusers? They've scattered. Go and be healed, Jesus tells the woman. He's teaching, bring the children unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus has been teaching and teaching and teaching. When the people bypassed the man at the pool of Bethesda and let him lay there, Jesus asked them, do you want to be made whole? And, and Jesus said, get up, take up your bed and walk. Jesus is teaching love in action. When they were selling doves outside the temple, exploiting the poor, saying, you need our doves in order for your sacrifice to matter. Jesus flipped those tables and scattered the proud and the exploitative practitioners. And he did it out of love. When the people gathered to hear Jesus speak and the day got long, the people were hungry and the disciples got antsy. Jesus took the little boy's lunch and fed 5,000 plus women and children with two fish and five small loaves of bread, teaching a spirit of abundance and not scarcity. When asked how to obtain eternal life, Jesus tells a story of a Samaritan who was an outcast, an unlikely character to do good to a Jewish person who goes above and beyond to be sure of the ongoing wellness of someone that society says should be his enemy. 
and says, go and do likewise. Jesus constantly taught love of others, care for others, healing for all, abundance for all. He was teaching against the status quo. And he so wanted the people to get it deep down in their hearts and souls. So he told them a parable in language they could understand so they could do a soil check. How is your soil? According to the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus then unpacks the parable to help the people further understand, and maybe for our understanding as well. Verse 18, hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches it away. What is sown in the heart that is what is sown on the path. Is this your soil? Do you not understand what you read or what you hear in the Bible or in our sermons or otherwise? If this is your soil and you don't quite understand and so you leave here and poof, whatever has been taught or preached is gone because it couldn't take root. Please talk to one of your pastors. This is why we plan to get and we must get back to Bible study because there are deep spiritual lessons in our faith that require more than this setup. Speaker, audience. It takes more. Any educators in here that know it takes more than that to learn for it to, to go deep so that you can live it out and even share it with someone else. So we need other formats so that the seeds aren't thrown and fall on the path and the birds come and pluck it away. If your soil is a soil that leaves you unclear of what you've heard such that it cannot take root, your pastors are here for that purpose and we will be engaging again in other ways of learning. The next soil, verse 20, as for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word, immediately receives it with joy. Yet, it says, such a person has no root because endures only for a while, because it, it endures only for a while, but when trouble and persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately, the text says, falls away. Soil check. Is this your soil? You enjoy a good sermon, but it only endures for a while. And when trouble comes and when life happens, when church happens or anything you learned about love, forgiveness, abundance, compassion, giving, faith gets tossed to the wind. Jesus was aware of such soil. Life application of one's faith is important, but it must be intentional. You've got to take what you hear and be intentional about reflecting on it as life happens. That's not when you put it to the side, that's when you pull it forward and close and think about it and meditate on it. You've got to want to try it. You've got to yearn for change and say, yes, I heard a good word. Seeds have been sown. Now how will I apply it? It has to be intentional. Allow it to take root so it can bear fruit. The next soil, verse 22, as for what was sown among thorns. This is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word and it yields nothing. Soil check, is this your soil? Similar to the last soil, this one also hears the word. They're in the space, they're in the church, if you will. So you're coming to church and reading your Bible and listening to sermons, but these seeds are sown among thorns. The challenge here is very specific, that the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke it. 
Some Christians conclude that when it comes to their wealth and their livelihood, this stuff simply does not apply. Some very active church members across this country, not here at High Park Union Church, but across this country, leave church on Sunday and do dirty business deals on Monday and have no conscience about it because it, that doesn't have to do with my wealth. That's, that's on Sunday. I'll deal with that again when I go back on Sunday. The lure of wealth makes them deem their faith irrelevant to how they do business. And Jesus says their faith and the seed sown yield nothing. The last soil. Verse 23, but as for what was sown on good soil. This is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. I hear the Spirit saying, that means don't compare. Don't compare to how abundant someone else is. You just be faithful and watch God bless you. So, soil check. When what is sown is sown in good soil. You receive it, understand it. That means you took some intentionality. Apply it to areas of your life, and fruit is born. Jesus is not trying to celebrate those who have good soil. He's teaching that the seed is capable of bearing great fruit. That if people conclude that a life of faith does not get results, they are mistaken. If people conclude in that day that all that Jesus was teaching and demonstrating was too hard and too radical, he's trying to tell them that it's worth it. Indeed, it will bear abundant fruitfulness. That loving your neighbor who is supposed to be your enemy will indeed bear fruit. That giving grace instead of severe punishment will indeed bear fruit. That welcoming children and allowing them to use their gifts to be heard and involved in the life of the church will indeed bear fruit. That being the one who helps those who seemingly can't help themselves instead of stepping over them like the man at the pool of Bethesda but you say, get up, take up your bed and walk and stay around long enough to help them on their way, that will indeed bear fruit. That ensuring that the vulnerable are not exploited but treated fairly and treated with spirit of abundance, especially in God's house, there is plenty. That will indeed bear fruit. That putting yourself in the shoes of another and going above and beyond to be sure that the ongoing well-being of someone who society says should be your enemy, that if we do that, we call it the Good Samaritan and we think it's just to change somebody's tire, but it is one of the deepest truths of our faith. And it will indeed bear fruit if it takes root. Jesus out of love so wanted the people then and us today to understand that while he's teaching countercultural principles and while he knows those won't always make you popular, as a matter of fact, they might make you unpopular, and while God's way might not support your plans for being wealthy, especially at the risk of others, and that if they and we would just allow God's ways to take root, We'll have peace that surpasses all understanding. We'll have joy that the world can't take away. We'll have a spirit of abundance which only makes for more. We'll have what we need and love and justice will reign in our lives on earth. In one case, a hundred in another 60 and in another 30, we've all got to do our own soil check. Only you really know how your soil is today. But we can also do a faith community soil check 
And remember that worship is not for show and it's not just for enjoyment. It's for edification and understanding. It's for spiritual growth and well-being. So that when the storm comes, I'm thinking about the story about the storm is going to come. It rains on the just and the unjust, but the house that will stand is one that's rooted. It has a foundation, different, different metaphor there. Because we come in here not just to be entertained and to leave. Our soil shall allow the lessons to take root and to manifest in our lives. When we, High Park Union Church, prioritize spiritual growth, when we, High Park Union Church, prioritize spiritual growth in our lives and in the life of the church, we will experience God's abundance. A hundredfold, some 60, and some 30. Praise God, hallelujah, and amen. God bless you.